Basic Neumes and Pneumatic Elements, Part 4, Four and Five Note Groups. Review from Part 3. What is the ordinary rhythm of cursive three note groups when followed by a new syllable? From memory, try to draw a torculus and a paractus using any notation. Now refer back to your notes to write each using two other kinds of notation. When followed by a new syllable, cursive three note groups ordinarily have the rhythm short, short, long. Review from part two. What is the effect of the episema on a group of notes, on a group of cursive notes? What is the melodic contour of the pes? What is the melodic contour of the clivis? What letters in the manuscript signify augmentation, diminution? The episema doubles a group of notes. It makes a group of cursive notes non-cursive. The pes signifies two pitches, the first low and the second high. The clivis signifies two pitches, the first high and the second low. Augmentation or lengthening is signified by the letter A or T in the manuscripts. Diminution is signified by C or N. Take a moment to review the abbreviations and figures from parts 1 and 2. The concepts of this lesson will be the simplest to grasp of the series, but the terminology will be the most difficult. As in the previous lesson, I encourage you to trace the shape of the neumes with your right hand. Is it apparent yet that the Messine and Zankal neumes indicate the same gestures despite their different written appearance? The Pez subpunctus adds two or more descending notes to the Pez and has the contour low, high, low, low. The scandicus subpunctus adds two or more descending notes to the scandicus and has the contour low, high, high, low, low. The descending notes of the pes subpunctus and scandicus subpunctus are invariably printed as puncta inclinata in the Vatican edition. Subpunctus neumes can be more precisely classified as either sub-bipunctus or sub-tripunctus. The torculus resupinus has the contour low, high, low, high. It can be thought of either as a torculus with an added upper note, as its name implies, as a double pass, or as a parectus preceded by a lower note, which the notation of the Vatican edition implies. The parectus flexus has the contour high, low, high, low, and is the inverse of the torculus resupinus, a parectus with an added lower note which can also be thought of as a double clivus or a torculus preceded by a higher note. The parectus flexus can also be preceded by a lower auxiliary, in which case it becomes a parectus flexus urgens or parectus urgens flexus, which is to say a torculus resupinus flexus initio debilis or torculus initio debilis resupinus flexus. Having fun yet? Its contour is low, high, low, high, low. Longer compound neumes are described in the same manner, with the adjective strophicus or strophica, subpunctus, resupinus, or flexus added to the basic neum name, along with prepunctus to indicate a unison note at the beginning, which is also called a disaggregate neum in English. The sixth note, scandicus subbipunctus resupinus, followed by a clivus, is a well-known credential figure. The solemn editions give all six notes as short, which contradicts the unanimous testimony of the ancient manuscripts. For this reason, the neumes in question were selected for the title page of the Graduale Legal. In the first neum, the scandicus subbipunctus resupinus, it is readily apparent that the third and sixth notes are long and that the third is longer than the sixth. The extra long verga here is typical for this figure throughout Codex L and usually mirrored by an episema in the St. Gall neumes. It may be significant that the scribes never wrote scandicus plus parectus in this formula. 
Jan van Beesen proposes that the fourth and fifth notes here are extra short, exactly as in the corresponding figure in Byzantine chant. Summary of principal differences from the Salem method. There are no ternary compound beats. The rhythm is strictly binary. The horizontal epicema indicates doubling rather than nuanced lengthening. Long short forms of the passing clivus are practically non-existent. The verga of both Scandicus and Salicus is normally long. The normal syllabic value is long. One syllable set to a single and short note is the exception rather than the rule. The ariscus of the Salicus is normally short. All ornaments come before the beat and take their value from the preceding note. Now using the messeniums, try to identify all of the long notes in the requiem introit. Start by identifying each unsinus attractulus. Next, identify each verga. Next, identify the top note of each quillisma scandicus. Next, identify the last note of a practice element at the end of a compound neum. We haven't covered the quescent notes yet. The quiescence is a complex subject that is really beyond the scope of a presentation on basic neumes. For now, take my word that the upper note of the first syllable of perpetua is long, an augmentative cephalicus, which is the liquescent form of the clivus. In this lesson, we discuss the scandicus subbipunctus resupinus and its extra long verga. It is dotted in the rhythmic edition below with the two following puncta notated as more diminished value. Short notes between two long notes are also notated the same way. We also add a dot at the end of domine before the half bar line, which is strictly editorial. After you have marked the long notes with an epicema, your results should agree with this edition. <laughs> same chant in standard modern notation. Compare the circled sections in order to draw your own conclusion about the inconsistency in the mesenniums. Could there have been a slip of the pen, or is the substitution of a punctum for the quilisma significant? When considering such old manuscripts, there is also the possibility of deterioration affecting legibility, although it may not be apparent from a facsimile or triplex edition. In this and the previous lesson, we focus on cursive and partially cursive forms. The analogous non-cursive form should be immediately recognizable to anyone who has diligently studied parts 1 and 2.